Yeah. I'm going to start right now. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. Okay. Okay. So good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending uh, where you are basically in the world. And uh, my apologies uh, for delay. I mean, uh, it's actually, I should have checked basically the time more carefully, like uh, to make sure it was actually 11 a.m. basically Eastern time rather than Pacific uh, 2 p.m. So uh, thanks, Juan, for the introduction. And uh, what I want to discuss with you today is basically uh, some basically some results from uh, some recent research I've done basically on a new topic, which is basically the role of uh, behavioral factors in cognitive bias in rock engineering. We're going to we talk a lot basically about maybe rock mass behavior, equation, numerical modeling. But what is really interesting to me is actually the fact that we're going to see through a few slides that rock engineering is based on, on a very empirical, basically, foundation. So very inductive type of form of design. And therefore, the role of behavioral factors and cognitive bias is very, very large. And the reason why I started to look in this type of topic is because in the last two years, I've been reading books about uh, economical behavior, basically the, uh, the role of uh, behavior in economics or other basic disciplines. And it's actually interesting now, some of those basically outcomes, some of those lessons, they really apply to the field of rock engineering because of this inductive nature. So apologies, I was actually about to polish uh, this presentation when I got the, a message from Juan. So if there are some typos, I apologize for that. So, and I may have to quickly go through some slides in, in the interest of time. But this is really what I would like to talk about today is the role of knowledge, basically in the context of a rock engineer, what is actually knowledge? Basically more general context and our knowledge basically relates to experience and engineering judgment and the very basically important concept of uncertainty and variability. You can see here a quote from Peter Fox about the fact that uh, when we deal with geology, that there are conditions that for us are unforeseeable. So you don't see everything. You don't see inside the rock mass. You only see the outside of a rock exposure. You may see the, the rock through the core, but it's very different basically from analyzing 1D and 2D to actually get information for the actual three-dimensional nature of the rock mass. And also I'm gonna address this issue uh, of quantification of qualitative assessments. Everything we do in rock engineering, it's technically a quantification of a qualitative assessment, whether it's through rock smart classification system or other empirical approaches. We use numbers, but those numbers are qualities of the rock mass. They're not really quantity of the rock mass. And uh, to put everything in the context now, rock engineering, it's very good to see actually how rock engineers evolved since basically, let's say, pre-1960s up to today. You have what I call like a digitization of rock engineering, starting in the late 60s, early 70s, what really basically acquisitions that become more digital, first examples of numerical analysis, more and more numerical analysis through the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. And the real digitalization, basically really what we really apply in this technology to basically not just simply collecting in a digital way, but actually analyzing and try to make basically uh, analysis using new technology uh, technologies. And we have now basically access to fast computers. More and more of the younger generation are very basically comfortable with the uh, numerical analysis and coding, Python, machine learning scripts, we're going to talk about that at the end of the presentation, are becoming more and more familiar. So it's very important for me to look back at what is actually the foundation of rock engineering. Difficult to basically use all this technology without somehow reviewing basically what is basically the empirical past of uh, rock engineering. And the issue, basically everything, why basically I start to be interested in this uh, idea of behavioral factors comes from this one. So you have different problems, whether it's a slope problem, an open slope, uh, um, another basically slope or a tunnel, a bridge problem. You're dealing with rock. You're dealing basically with rock masses. You have limited basically uh, observation. You see a face that's been potentially excavated. So what you see is a damage technically uh, exposure. But the major issue that we have with rock engineering is that it's not a, 
a discipline that is prototypal in nature. That means if you do mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, you build prototypes. Now you even build digital prototypes in those disciplines. We cannot really build prototypes in, in rock engineering. You don't build a prototype of a slope, you test it, and then you build it. You just excavate a slope, you excavate a tunnel. You put the foundation of a bridge on basically on, on a slope, but you don't do the prototype and see what happens. You may install monitoring systems to see the behavior, but we basically, again, taking some kind of terminology out of mechanical engineering, you kind of extrude basically you in the material. You remove things by excavation, and then of course you change the condition. So we are bound to look basically at the rock mass behavior in a very empirical way. So we look at basically at deriving quality, uh, qualitative data, potentially quantitative data like UCS of the rock, basically like strength properties that you measure in the lab. It makes basically qualitative observation, quantitative observation to come up with rock mass behavior. Most of the things that we do with rock engineering, it's been developed in the 1960s, 1970s, all the classifications that we are so familiar with, RMR, Q, GSI, they all come from this type of, um, this kind of time period. And because it's an inductive, so therefore very experiential based uh, discipline, you are bound to have basically habits. So different people feel comfortable with different systems. They keep using those system, specifically in their analysis. So those system becomes habits. So you tend to basically settle on those. You feel comfortable with those and you don't really want to give, give them up. So almost try to justify any bias they may have because you feel basically you think they work. So one thing that really basically is missing in rock engineering, although we think they exist, it's industry standards. We call something industry standards, but uh, it's interesting actually I was talking with my students this morning, like about different RMR tables, like which one to use. So we don't really standardize basically what we're doing or we pretend we standardize through systems but even if maybe those systems don't really basically work or are applicable to every condition. And when it comes to knowledge, I mean, uh, we then tend to, in my opinion, confuse knowledge with the experience with engineering judgment. You have knowledge, which basically would really help us making decision. I'll give an example here. This is a cross-section, geological cross-section through the geology between France and England to basically that was used to the excavate the channel tunnel. So imagine if you were to dig basically this tunnel blindly with no knowledge of the geology, it would literally basically definitely lead to disasters. So without the knowledge basically which kind of layers uh, through which you want to basically tunnel through, what kind of more impermeable layer, you, you expose yourself to very, very high risks. And when it comes to knowledge, the problem is that very difficult to quantify knowledge. I mean, how do you measure the knowledge? Becomes basically kind of more an abstract concept. And because it's somehow abstract, basically the issue is that I see sometimes myself uh, having to explain something to basically uh, people that don't really have maybe a rock engineering background. And that happens when you're dealing with some uh, more sensitive projects, when there is a risk. And I'll give this, I took this photo here from the internet, but like it's a, imagine try to build like a nuclear waste repository. We can really basically be confident in our design and our rock engine design, but you have to explain the risk to basically people that are not really familiar with rock engineering. They would not really almost probably care about the actual rock engineering side. They only risk care about the consequence of failure and basically what happens if there is a failure. And we know that you don't really have basically a situation where the probability of failure will be zero. So every time you say there's a risk, even maybe 1%, half a percent risk, you have to remember this is actually interpreted in a very subjective way by the public. So that's why uh, I will start to have also this interest. So like, how do you communicate a message in terms of rock engine design to people that they are not really familiar with rock engine design? And it's not just a factor of safety problem anymore. It's a risk problem. So this is where basically the cognitive bias and the subjectivity comes really in, into play. And this is the way I uh, imagine basically uh, knowledge, experience and judgment. 
is basically like a matrix, basically a series of nodes connected by lines. Your experience is moving from one node to the next node. So you have different learning nodes. You move basically to the nodes in a very sequential way. You may potentially jump one node, but you still move along a line to a next node. Every, by basically working on different projects, by building up your experience, you basically connect more and more nodes. The point is, if you're dealing with a, an inductive type of form of design, you're dealing with basically current devices, basically subjectivity. So this kind of connection is actually not linear. It's kind of more a perturbation, kind of a curve, basically. And sometimes there's a divergence. Different people have different opinions. You actually basically diverge. They may actually reach different conclusions, even if technically you have you're analyzing the same problem. Engineering judgment is what should allow you somehow to look at your potential mistakes or maybe reconsider your uh, experience. So it's this kind of uh, line here that basically, uh, let me put the point. Uh, It's basically this line here, basically where you try to basically go back and maybe change your mind because you, you realize that potentially uh, a problem. So this is really what is experience and engineering judgment. Not knowledge is actually something more than that. Knowledge is the, the idea that you could actually jump from every single learning node. So the point is like, you can't really do that. It's like, a, it's very difficult to basically be able to jump and see all the connection between all the learning nodes. With time, maybe you'll be able to do maybe a couple of jumps, but you will not be in a position to know all the potential jumps. Some of these jumps are gonna be un unknown to you. So basically this is the idea of, eventually we're gonna talk later about unknown uncertainty. How do you know something that you don't know? Basically this you don't know, you don't know, and you're not gonna be able to basically develop that even through experience. 20 years experience and 30 years of experience. And all basically comes down with this basically concepts of variability and uncertainty. And I've seen sometimes there's a confusion in, a, in Rock Engineering when we talk about this concept. I've seen people talk about uncertainty when we, we actually deal with variability. Like let's say friction angle of a surface ranges from 25 to 45 degrees, just an example. People see that as a measurement of uncertainty. That's not uncertainty. There's actually certainty about the variability of the parameter. So the uncertainty comes where you, you have no knowledge. If you don't know what is actually the, the mean and the max of the range, that's uncertainty. So the lack of knowledge is your uncertainty. The knowledge of a variability, this is actually just variability, is that you actually have knowledge. So we start typically here in rock engineering, we don't have data some drill hole data to begin with, but you start with completely ignorance. You don't have the data. You build up your data set and you move by using the degree of knowledge towards the right, but you will never achieve a state of complete knowledge for what we discussed before. Our basically goal is to achieve a state of knowledge that allows us to look at the variability of the rock mass. Rock mass is a natural variable. We have to accept that. So we have to kind of resist the temptation to assign kind of very precise numbers to everything. We have to work with ranges, whether it's RMR range or Q or GSI range. This idea that everything is so precise is, doesn't really make sense in rock engineering. You're dealing with naturally variable materials, spatially variable material. Basically, even the same rock masses in different parts of the same rock mass, uh, spatially different parts, you may actually have different, for example, fracture intensity, but technically it's the same rock mass. So the idea is that you reduce the risk, basically to design. And the only way to reduce the risk is by reducing uncertainty. You reduce uncertainty, that means that you collect more data, you have better knowledge of the rock mass, at least better knowledge of the potential outcomes. As I say, you will never reach complete knowledge of a rock mass. And the reason why that one is that, uh, remember that we're dealing with rock masses, as I said, it's not a prototypal type of discipline, rock engineering. So we have to collect data. And typically we collect it in the forms of boreholes, but boreholes are one dimensional sampling. Yes, the borehole technically is 3D itself, the core, but it represents data along the line. So it's a one dimensional sampling. You may get orientation, you may get fracture frequency, 
but you don't have, for example, fracture length from a borehole. As you basically develop your project, you access more basically data. You may do exploratory drifts, maybe tunnels, pilot tunnels. You start to see like a two-dimensional representation of your uh, rock mass, you have uh, rock exposures, but you're still maybe far away from where you actually want to basically develop, for example, a mine. Like you say, you do a blockade mine, you have your decline, you want to reach the, your body, the, the production level. Well, I need to sink my decline first to my shaft before I actually do the development. So I don't really have knowledge of my block until I actually reach the block. So it was actually easy is that we do all this type of um, data collection. Basically, we start to get more and more data at the end of a project. That's really when we get a more basically knowledge of the rocks. So you have a start time where you have more assumptions from the beginning. So a large basically degree of assumption you have to make and the number of assumption reduces as you collect more data. But the access to data is basically opposite. So I always make this example, I try to explain this one. Imagine if you have to fly on a plane and uh, you build a plane, but you had no knowledge of the material properties that you used to build a plane. The only way to find out whether it's gonna fly or not is to fly the plane. So would you board the plane? I mean, you definitely don't wanna be a passenger on that plane because you have no idea whether it's gonna fly or not. Or maybe it's gonna fly, maybe crash later because you had made assumption on some properties. So we work almost the opposite way in rock engineering compared to the kind of like deductive type of engineering disciplines. So we have not much access to data at the beginning, therefore there's more potential risk. So we have now technology to collect more and more data from the beginning, whether it's downhole geophysics, uh, basically map drilling, remote sensing techniques, even now the new holographic, basically virtual reality type of data collection. And we can kind of close a bit the gap in terms of data collection but you will not really close it completely because everything's one dimensional typically. So you will not really see the rock mass until literally you develop the project. So the degree of uncertainty basically hopefully decreases with time, but this is actually where this becomes only theoretical because if you use now a very qualitative type of assessment, then the way we process the data, the way our human mind process the data may actually induce, increase the level of uncertainty because you have human uncertainty. There's various type of uncertainty and those basically we're gonna see plays different role. But here again, another example to show you like uh, the difference between one dimensional sampling, two dimensional sampling, three dimensional rock masses. So rock masses are 3D, but we only see potentially 1D version of them or potentially two dimensional version of them. We can build a model like this one, but remember to build this model, I need three dimensional information because I need fracture length and basically distribution of fractures in space. So how do I build a model, three-dimensional model based on one-dimensional sample or two-dimensional sample? There will be some assumption that you have to make. So, and sometimes we may basically make some uh, um, very conservative assumptions, but we have to be careful because being very conservative, yes, we may think it reduce the risk, but it doesn't remove the risk completely as we're gonna see later with this kind of unknown uncertainty. Because we have uncertainty in rock engineering, but we have different type of uncertainty, whether it's geological uncertainty, parameter uncertainty, model uncertainty, and human uncertainty. And we have to somehow live with those. So geology, we can probably do something with it if you collect more and more data, parameter and model uncertainty. Well, it depends on the type of analysis we wanna do, scale effects, well, again, they exist. We can try to upscale rock mass properties, but again, you're not gonna simulate the behavior of rock mass properties in a lab. So you can simulate in a computer, but you're not gonna be able to test it physically. So there will be always some parameter uncertainty. Model uncertainty is like, what kind of model do you use? Oak and Brown, more Coulomb, S-shape fellow criterion for uh, massive rock masses. All of them may work in some specific cases, but they don't may be applicable to all the cases. And then you have the big one, which is the really, what it really kind of focused my attention in this uh, in the last couple of years, which is human uncertainty. How do you deal with the fact that we are humans, we collect data in different ways, and we don't really have real standards, like quantitative standards to collect the data. And then you're dealing with 
experience different professional opinions. You're dealing with different people doing different aspects of the project. A data transfer, which also basically induces uncertainty because some data are lost, not physically lost, but literally lost, less maybe forgotten or not used by different people. So you have this kind of preferential attachment bias where people like the system and not the other one. So, and that really has an implication in the type of analysis we do. But also we have to consider that you're dealing with scale dependency in uncertainty. We have scale dependency in properties, but technically you also have scale dependency in uncertainty because you have big projects and small projects. The idea you think that you're drilling more and more holes, so you get more and more data. And you, the idea is that by doing so, you reduce basically your, uh, your risk, basically you, re, you reduce the, the influence of what we call unknown uncertainty. So basically you do a project that doesn't matter if you put more and more data in it, the outcome is not gonna change. But there are situations where actually adding one information may actually totally change the outcome of your design. So you have to see different type of basically uncertainty different at different scales. So I was reading this book by Taleb in 2010, basically it's a, a book more about the, uh, the role of risk, the role of basically uh, biases in uh, more in the context of finance rather than actually engineering, but it's very interesting how you can say, extrapolate from those concepts and apply them to rock engineering. So that's why we introduced this concept of uh, open set or closed set uncertainty. So you have uh, potentially, you collect enough data and adding more data to your data sample doesn't really change the outcome of your design. That means that your uncertainty now, basically your, the role of unknown uncertainty becomes smaller. Or you have potentially a situation where adding a little bit more data may actually put you down a different path when it comes to your design. So let's say you do design and data collection, you see these major structures behind the, the, the wall of, of an open pit. Or what if you're dealing with um, rock bridges? How do you quantify inter-rock bridges basically in, um, in slope stability analysis or tunnel analysis? when basically it's almost almost very difficult just to define what is a rock bridge itself. And if you think in terms of the uh, graphically, in terms of uh, open pit design, and you look at basically the design of a bench, uh, inter ramp or the overall slope, if you fix the level of knowledge that you have, let's say you fix this level of knowledge, that level of knowledge may be such that you don't really have kind of unknown uncertainty at the bench scale level, basically, a bench face angle is not going to really change by collecting more orientation data or by drilling an additional borehole. Maybe for the same level of uh, uncertain knowledge, it may actually have an implication on uh, interramp angle, but definitely may have a large implication for overall slope angle. Because at the larger scale, maybe missing a fault is more and more basically important. So, or missing some basic the existence of uh, maybe a, a weak zone or shear zone. So this kind of gap between what you know and what you, you don't know you don't know becomes bigger and bigger as basically as you increase the size of the project. So you have basically to deal with this kind of a scale effects also when it comes to uncertainty. So the truth is that you have, uh, you know, possibly we, we kind of, we don't almost like to accept that it actually exists that we're dealing with this uh, unknown uncertainty. We need to realize there's something that we don't know and we don't really know that we don't know. That means that no matter how much data you collect, you can't really basically overcome basically a result of some uh, potential basically um, kind of negative result because there's no way for you to know that the condition exists to actually bring you down that path. So you may try to collect more data, but still as I, as I made the example before, if you collect, for example, vertical boreholes and you have a basically maybe in between a very kind of a normal fault, you may miss completely a normal fault if you don't really interpret the geological data correctly. So sometimes we miss data because we cannot really see it. And that's basically brings you to this kind of unknown uncertainty. It's like you don't see inside the rock mass. Everything we do is based on uh, uh, inductive basic exper experience. So it's not really based on factual experience or so kind of more phenomenal type of experience. So 
if we don't basically use this kind of affective experience, then we start believing in some kind of systems and the validity of the systems. And somehow basically we kind of anchor ourselves to the system. We're not open actually maybe to consider potentially other methods of design or methods of analysis. It becomes potentially very academic, potentially very psychological, basically this discussion, but that's the, basically the, um, the baseline. I mean, you're dealing with experience, so kind of an analysis that develops based on experience. So your the way the human mind works is becomes very, very important. So that's why we make decision. We think we make decision based on numbers, but potentially makes decision only based on what we think is the correct basic approach, but not necessarily is the correct approach. And uh, I give you an example when it comes to unknown uncertainty, basically unknown unknowns. So you have data, like in this case, fracture frequency from boreholes, and you need to fill the gaps here because you don't have data. You may use Kriege method or other type of geostatistical method to fill the gap, but you, there's no way for you to know whether your model is correct or not unless you literally drill a hole. But even if let's say you drill one single hole, how much do you know that that maybe data is that you collected still valid far away from that basic kind of validation hole? And uh, let's imagine that you try to basically collect data like this. And you have, for example, factor frequency or grade levels, any type of information that you can actually quantify. This kind of the idea of filling the gaps in the, in the data that we have basically brings about the issue of how you justify basically um, your analysis. You deal with geology, should we be really careful to do it kind of justification based on geology, not just based on engineering systems, like you deal with geology, how you basically correlate this information, not just simply by joining basically the dots, because I can get this type of intersection looking at basically potentially totally different basically geological context. Some of those are potentially not realistic, like this one. Some becomes a little bit more realistic, but still with kind of weird question why you have these kind of blobs being formed geologically. Others, it becomes, looks a little bit more realistic, kind of, kind of lenses that may justify why you see that basically information in boreholes. Some that may be more conservative or less conservative, depending on what you're looking. If you're looking, for example, at a grade of in terms of gold, some people may see more or less depending on who is actually analyzing the data. The investor or basically someone else has maybe more like a, a critical review of the of the data. Because technically, I can get the same information with something as silly as this one. So we have to be very careful. This is actually very important when it comes to machine learning and the, those kind of automated algorithms. You need to teach an algorithm to think in geological sense. How do you teach geology to an algorithm? Or rock mechanics to an algorithm, because if you just ask the, geo, uh, the algorithm to look at intersections, any of these technically match the results. So the the trick here is basically the, the issue. It becomes uh, how do you teach now this technology, rock mechanics or geology in general? Image recognition works very well when it comes to uh, let's say clicking on an image say, what is a, a traffic light? What is a bicycle, what is a car? So what is the pedestrian crossing? We all see this type of approach uh, when you deal with certain logging in some web pages on, or oh, that's just the typical approach they use actually to teach cars to basically drive on their own because you have clear idea what is a traffic light, what is basically uh, a car. But how do you teach someone to recognize maybe variability in grades or just, more the geotechnical parameters, they are very qualitative. Difficult because the description on the image would depend on whoever does the analysis. And that's the problem. If it's subjective, then it's difficult to quantify it. So quickly on this one, just basically to say that uh, you have different phases in every, every project from the field data collection to, for example, to numerical analysis. What you do, you're transferring information in these steps, the data transfer means that you're transferring any type of uncertainty you have. The idea that during the transfer, you reduce the uncertainty, but remember that potentially may increase the uncertainty by adding basically subjectivity by bias into your analysis. If someone says, I use this method because I like it, 
rather than this method, and they're both qualitative methods, then that's a subjectivity, it's a model uncertainty they introduce or human uncertainty introduce. So you actually add uncertainty by preferentially using a system rather than the system based on a real, basically, let's say quantitative justification of why one system is better than the other. As I said, you're not gonna really remove uncertainty completely. So this becomes like a, a limit state condition, really then a, the idea that incomplete knowledge of a rock mass. So you have known uncertainty, known variability, you have your knowledge, but then you should add kind of an, an extra basically line that represents your cognitive biases. If you're dealing with sub, uh, qualitative analysis, there's a preferential attachment to some type of methods. And therefore, we may actually introduce more uncertainty by preferentially using something. And you have a, like a big cloud of unknown uncertainty that you cannot really quantify. It's no unknown uncertainty is unknown to you. The existence of some basically uh, potential structure. It, there's no way for you actually to forecast those because you don't even think about the problem. So those are basically is behind and it stays behind basically the, the scene. So you're not gonna remove that one. And even sometimes the intervention, this unknown uncertainty may be totally random or may be the results of you keeping doing maybe a, um, kind of propagating a mistake. So it may actually reveal itself eventually if you basically propagating like a, a mistake. So our judgment is biased, whether we, it's kind of difficult sometimes to accept that because we think that the more experience you get, the more engineering judgment you get. But uh, an experience is only based on one, simple, one system is gonna be limited. So we have to be careful because we tend to really agree with something we like and we don't agree with something that we don't like. Our mind works like that. We are, we're not just engineers, we are humans. So we cannot simply say that the engineer, the engineer mind works differently from the general human mind. So we are still kind of victims of this cognitive biases, even if we are engineers. So, and the other problem, just looking at time. Uh, so that we have to understand is like, are we really truly measuring engineering properties? This is something that uh, I was exposed to a few years ago during a presentation by Professor Harrison. It's uh, the fact that you have different scales of measurement. And this is actually very important because what kind of scale of measurement we use in rock engineering? Because you have nominal, ordinal, they're very quantitative. Interval and ratio measurements are very quantitative. But then when you look at what we measure or we pretend we measure in rock engineering is the majority is qualitative assessments. RMR, Q, GSI, they're all qualitative assessments. And when it comes to statistics, actually, you're actually limited in what you can really do with these qualitative assessments. And still we play with statistics when it comes to classification systems. So we treat them as quantitative measurements when in reality they are qualitative assessments. And that basically actually has implication when it comes to uh, using, for example, limit state equilibrium in analysis, basically in a rock engineering, because you don't really difficult to define really what is the standard deviation or the mean of these qualitative assessments. Yes, you can calculate them. No one's going to stop you because you're dealing with numbers in a, maybe an Excel file, but you have to think about is it actually meaningful to do that? Those are not qualitative measurements. One thing I was actually surprised to see is that as engineers, we, we'd like to basically to um, something you may have maybe lost the, the last two, few seconds because I got a message about unstable connection. So I'll try to repeat here. So what we see in rock engineering typically is that this idea that we can describe everything with numbers. We just want numbers to plug into equation to do our design. For example, here you have Duke and Brown field criterion and the ge geological strength index. But we have to remember that we're dealing with geology. So if I were to ask you, uh, a GSI of 65, an MI of 12, so we're dealing with a, a limestone here, and a UCS of 100, and I plot Duke and Brown field criterion, here, these parameters, 
is this rock mass massive or very blocky? I have a, a failure envelope here. Am I dealing with a massive or very blocky rock mass? You can see that it's very difficult to answer this question here. You just have a line, you have a GSI, and different people, when you look at the GSI, may think uh, different, basically have different opinions. The problem is that when you look at the chart, the GSI can be anything from massive to very blocky. So we created systems where in a kind of a way we can get anything we want from these systems without geological more. We have to remember that RMR, Q, GSI, they are classification systems are, and they are used to look at the rock mass quality. So geology is part of those systems. When we kind of sterilize the system from the geology, we remove the geology from the systems. That's where the, the problem begins. The problem is not with those systems, QRMR and, and GSI, they're okay. And there's nothing wrong with those. The problem is the way we use them, they actually make them kind of, we use them probably in the wrong way. We should remember this geology behind. If you look at the papers by uh, Dr. Barton, you can actually see that he says basically you should look at basically different distribution, different frequency. You should actually present it. That be just the Q value that you present is those histograms as well. Those histograms are a fundamental part of the Q system, but we rarely do that. So why we don't do that? Why we don't actually pre present the data as well? That's the data that basically makes the problem irreversible if you remove them, because then there's no way for you to go back and say, well, GSI 65 five is massive or blocky, or in this case, very blocky. And uh, so the idea is that we need to bring back, basically put geology back into these systems. We need to remember that we need geology. So it's very important that we then accept also the qualitative nature of these measurements and the fact that we deal with geology. And if you look at recent paper by uh, Marinos and Carter, this is one of my students combined everything in this kind of figure. And you can see that different geology plots in different parts of the GSI chart. And there are areas that almost there's no data. That means that geologically that condition does not exist. But if you now tell a machine to use this chart, the machine will feel free to use everything. Any potential lines is free basically to use for the machine. So this is where the complication comes of teaching geology to machines. We also sometimes ignore this basic type of uh, condition, the fact that these systems are geology based. So there is a geological context in the system and not all the conditions that you see in the charts are actually geological viable. So they're actually geologically possible. Imagine I try to teach this to a machine. If you try to recognize what is the GSI, but well, the machine will just simply pick any potential basically line uh, combination that you get from whether remark or GSI as geologically possible because they don't really have the, the knowledge of the geology. And when it comes to uncertainty also, we have to remember that uh, the scale effects as I already mentioned before, but also remember that we're dealing with, and I do a lot of numerical analysis, I have to come up with the properties from the numerical models. I need to upscale my models all the time. And when I do the upscaling, it means that I'm losing something. Well, I need to give up something, like whether I give up resolution in terms of uh, how many fractures I can put in my model, or the fact that I'm using an equivalent continuum approach. And therefore, I'm simplifying the problem. But am I simplifying the problem too much, or am I simplifying the problem up to a point where the behavior becomes very different? So that's the question we have to be careful then sometimes trust in some models because they may actually not represent reality anymore, or they may represent a reality that may be very different from basically the actual physical reality that we try to simulate. Knowing that we have to do simplification, you're not gonna be able to simulate everything in a, in a model. And that's not actually the, the purpose of the model because as I say, you, you don't know everything in terms of the rock mass. So how can you expect the model to be so accurate when even your knowledge is not basically that uh, accurate about a, about a rock mass. And uh, we had to deal basically also with this kind of human factors and empirical habits of this fact that basically, as I said before, the knowledge, even when examined, will be lead to appropriate action. And the fact that you have this kind of issue with industry standards. So we make ourselves believe that we use system, there are standards because everyone used them. But remember, 
when you actually look at the definition industry standard, it doesn't mean it's correct. The definition set is basically accepted, that is basically established. That doesn't mean correct. The word correct doesn't come in the definition of industry standard, which is actually surprising. Though it's not even mentioned the word correct, like it's, so it's just established. It means that it's been used by a large amount of people. So we have to be careful with that because like how you then, again, see in terms of machine learning and a new technology, use system, they're not really basically correct. If I use system that's not correct, then I keep propagating whatever basically bias I have. So, and I'm gonna use the example of RQD. So RQD is a system that we use a lot in rock engineering. It's actually typically defined as industry standards. And if technically, when you go back to the actual definition and the use of RQD, several people actually criticize this kind of use of RQD. We, for example, ignore the fact of how the 10 centimeter threshold came about in RQD. How did they actually define this? And when you look at the actual papers, you're gonna see there's actually a very limited database supporting the threshold. But then we don't wanna use something that the same authors of RQD actually developed, which is a weight RQD. This actually works better than the standard RQD with 10 centimeter threshold. You have, for example, authors like uh, Biniaski, basically arguing what maybe we should keep using our, uh, RQD in RMR. Maybe we should use a fractional frequency. But then we tend to ignore even this message that comes out because we kind of anchor ourselves on, uh, on our habits and what we tend to use on a daily basis. And another example, actually, this kind of anchoring biases, preferential kind of attachment biases, is this one. When you look at the actual database of the systems that we, that we used to define, for example, Q and RMR, again, look at the geology, very geology. So you have very different systems developed for different geology, and then look at every book in rock engineering, you always find correlation between Q and RMR. Very different systems. So why we keep looking, using those equations that correlate RMR and Q, when clearly they were defined for different geology, clearly they use different, basically, parameters. You may do a qualitative correlation, like good quality rock mass in Q equal good quality rock mass in RMR, but this mathematical correlation with the equations is very dangerous. Because also, if you try to plot them, you come up with very, very different answer. There's, I found at least 20 different equations correlating RMR to, to Q, and they all plot basically like a big scatter, basically, data set when you try to put them together. And this is actually a message by uh, Dr. Kaiser, 2019 Mueller lecture. Basically, it says each system has its own merit, and we should use them independently from each other, but we should really resist the temptation to correlate to use those mathematical equations to come up with an RMR from a Q of OGSI vice versa. And uh, 11.55, I'm, I'm probably do a couple of slides, one, and then uh, I wanna make sure that if anyone question can actually ask you. I just wanna finish on this idea of RQD. So let's look what happened with RQD now. Let's imagine you have a model, you build a rock mass model, and uh, you have a, a pothole through this rock mass. This is a 30 meter cube rock mass, uh, and we scale down to 50 meter cube for the analysis. It's actually a real case scenario. This is actually real geology from a Ruben Pillar mine in the UK. So with that sensitivity on increasing the, the intensity is actually the, the data for one particular intensity is actually uh, real data. And if I look at the RQD now, they measure different scales. If I were to do different boreholes and look in RQD at three meters length, 10 meters length, 50 meters length, you can see that you have variability. By doing such a small scale kind of a RQD, like core run length typically, you have variability, which is not real rock mass variability, is a perceived variability because of this type of approach you're using. In reality, this rock mass, if I wanna look at the RQD of 30 meters, is about 75, basically, which is kind of the average of whatever basically range you get. But you can't simply then use this 58 and say, I want to be conservative because this represents literally almost like a very kind of localized condition. There's not a rock mass condition. It's a condition at three meter scale, not at the scale of the rock mass, not at the scale of the, your geotechnical domain. And plus you have basically orientation bias. You can see the same rock mass described by very different results. So you have 76, 67. You have a number, 
Europa is very different because you change the orientation. And imagine the physics uh, kind of a, uh, if you try to go back to a physics example, imagine if you want to measure the, the weight of a bottle of water. If you have one liter bottle of water, and let's say we, we stay basically given basically elevation. So basically the humidity and temperature doesn't really change. Well, we can estimate very quickly, measure, measure very quickly the weight of the bottle of water. It doesn't matter how much you spin the bottle of water, whether it's horizontal or vertical, it's exactly the same. But here you have a rock mass property or so-called rock mass property that changes depending on the orientation of the borehole. So you can see that that number is not rock mass properties anymore. It's a quality that we assign to the, to the rock mass. 67, 76, exactly the same quality technically. And that's the point from a quality point of view, no difference. From a quantity point of view, big difference. And actually that you can plot this one with different intensity, you can see the different uh, uh, changes. So technically, uh, when I was about to prepare this presentation, I have extra slides in it by one, but I think that it was supposed to be only a uh, one hour presentation. So I'll stop here. And then uh, if we have quickly have some questions because later we go into the more on the uh, concept of basically of uh, uh, prediction. So happy to basically share anyway the full length of the presentation uh, to make it available as a PDF to everyone. So you can actually finish and see. It's published anyway in a paper, so it's nothing really new. So, but uh, for the interest of time, I just stop here because uh, uh, I, I would like to give you the opportunity anyway to answer a uh, question if you have any questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Elmo. I think uh, like what, what all you have presented so far, I think is, is very interesting, very, very relevant. Uh, and especially for the, I see that there's a lot of students uh, from in mining engineering uh, from our department. I think it is very important that they start thinking on, on this and uh, that they realize that, uh, okay, these empirical approaches are, 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 are there, but uh, that's not the only way to analyze a problem, right? Uh, you should always uh, keep your mind open to, to new approaches and, and uh, think about the problem you have and see what is the best approach to, to solve it. So you make the right decision. So I don't know if anybody from the from the public have a question. Uh, I think I, I have one uh, right now. And uh, I, I think while the people write the questions in the chat, I think I, 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 I would like to ask this one. So how, how should these concepts of maybe like cognitive biases and uncertainty uh, should, how these concepts should be included in in standards and regulations in engineering projects you know uh, governments uh, are concerned of safety in mining projects and ground control uh, accidents is in many countries is like the first uh, cause of, of fatalities and, and also injuries so so how how should or what would be the best way that you think that these concepts should be in, in like uh, implemented into those regulations? Do you think everything should be, or every case study mine or every every project should be analyzed in a, in a particular case-to-case -case basis or uh, there should be like, that we should keep using these empirical equations just so the government has like more tools or has like uh, something easy to to base their, their analysis on? What, what is your perception uh, with that? I think it's a, it's such a very good question. I mean, like, it's very difficult. I mean, we talk about cognitive biases. So how do you quantify them? Because the, by nature, they are very subjective. So the way basically how human mind works. So what we should really do to me is like try to move to a more quantitative, real quantitative basically form of measurements, real quantitative data, like whether it's fractal frequency, for example, instead of RQD, something that is, even if technically still direction dependent fractal frequency, but at least is a, is a real measure. So doesn't matter who record it, doesn't matter basically, um, uh, it's not really dependent on this kind of tensity meter threshold. So something that is potentially more quantitative. That's really basically, it's easy to make a standard if you have some a real quantity, something you can really measure. When you deal with quality, then it's difficult to come up with a standard. You may say guidelines, so we can actually try to say people, maybe you do this analysis and you stay within some kind of a bounds given by guidelines, but uh, we have to also to remember that you, even if you were kind of these standards, you're not gonna remove the risk. You're not gonna really 
remove the risk completely. So even when you do risk analysis, I mean, uh, it's qualitative. I mean, you may quantify probability of failure, but how do you quantify the consequence of failure? Yeah, you can make quantify in terms of how much it costs to fix a problem. But when it comes then to human life and uh, basically consequence to people, very difficult to quantify. Is it one person basically killed one too many or is acceptable? How, does it, how do you make that decision? Because that's really difficult to make those de decisions. So in a way, as engineer, we are lucky. We don't have to maybe make those type of decision, kind of more like policy decision, like, uh, but uh, it's difficult to remove anyway completely the quality nature of, um, uh, of our analysis. And uh, I know that we tend to use, uh, and, and actually I was supposed to say that in the, in the lecture eventually, but like was a, think about this one, like uh, you have probability of failure and factor of safety. If I were to explain to someone, say, which one you prefer? You want to do a factor of safety analysis or probability of failure? People's gonna pick factor of safety analysis because it's got factor and safety in it. Try to imagine to the public, it says the probability of failure of a dam or tailing dam is, 1% or 0.5%. It's very, very small, but still you call about probability of failure. Automatically you imply the dam may actually fail. But if you tell people the factor of safety of the tailing dam is 1.3, oh, then it's stable. Is it really stable or is it stable for the condition you analyzed? 1.3 doesn't mean the probability of failure is zero. So that's the basically the 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 problem also to quantify in real standards and guidelines a perception of basically risk and failure. Yeah, it's it's very interesting and it, it makes you think definitely. Yeah. So here Fawad uh, just asked a question and he he's, he says that Dr. Erno has pushed rock mass characterization from objective domain to subjective domain. Uh, will it Will it not make worse the already bad problem of data scarcity in geotechnical engineering? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Like uh, the problem is that we have very little data. I mean, we would like to have more data and eventually we collect more data, but uh, we have to realize that some of the data we have, it's not analyzed in a very quantitative way. So as I said, it would be good to collect more quantitative data, even if it's less, well, maybe not large at the beginning, like, um, and also somehow resistant temptation. I know that people now, there's uh, uh, lots of people push towards, for example, machine learning, this kind of automations. Automation is very good. I mean, I'm definitely totally in favor of technologies and algorithms, but we have to recognize that I teach basically a machine to do quickly analysis or try to create basically data sets from nothing. When the data set that you use for creating the algorithms in first place is limited. And the fact that many of those algorithms are big black boxes on their own. So you don't almost have controls on actually what they're doing. So, and as I said, it's easy to see correlations sometimes between data, but are those correlations real, like real representation of physical, basically, um, mechanisms? So unfortunately, I, I was becoming a little bit pessimistic when I was starting to do this research because it's like, it's actually getting worse. I'm not making myself feeling better when I do this one. Because when I realized that we have actually more problems, we try to see ourselves as engineers, but how do you com really combine geology and engineering? It's not easy, I mean, the, to strike a good balance between geology and engineering. Hello, hey. Dr. Elmo. This is yep. Aman here. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. It was really insightful. And I have one question here. So you mentioned yep. like finding the perfect balance between uh, feeding those uh, parameters into the numerical modeling uh, uh, models, numerical models and uh, the time that we have to put in to run those. So how to find that perfectly balanced like zone um, for our models, like uh, how to decide how much data to feed and if we have so much of data, um, like how to go with that? Uh, I tend to, I mean, I all my backgrounds, lots of backgrounds, numerical analysis, I've done lots of numerical analysis. Then I always basically, I mean, you have some data you may get from lab testing or uh, other type of information. It also really depends on what type of model you use because you have complex model that needs more and more variables, more data. 
So that's why sometimes we tend to go to simple limit equilibrium, simple inverted comma, because finite element is not simple, but we can more continuum approach because if you start to push in like a, the properties of these continuities and scale effects on these continuities, then it means more data that we don't have or we more difficult to justify. So the way I see models to me is that uh, I don't see models as a, to predict behavior. To me, the model is there to tell me a range of outcomes or to really teach me what is the controlling parameter in this type of problem? How much is a problem sensitive to a variation in a parameter? This is actually where real models are really good at because you can run sensitivity analysis, different scenarios, and really understand, is it maybe this parameter controlling the failure or this other parameter? I'm not really looking for a, a prediction. I don't really believe models can predict, basically, because the limited data that we have and because more simplification of reality. So you can't predict the future of reality if you simplify the reality in the first place. So even if you do back analysis, you predicted the past, you didn't predict the future. So to me, the models, that's what they're really good at. And we should run models because uh, to really understand the behavior of rock masses, they have large scale problems. You can't really simulate, test them in the lab. But it's there to teach you basically to learn, make you learn, is it the friction angle of the joints? So this orientation of the joints is the maybe a doing with block caving, like is the, is the draw rate, the critical parameter is basically the cave advance. And then you can actually separate you have what I call design variables, something that you can really play with in your design, like change maybe the design layout and parameters that are fixed. You can't change the geology. The geology is given to you by nature. So whether you like it or not, that's your body. You can't change it. So you know that if the model is really sensitive to those properties, then you're bound to stay with those. But you can have other variables that can actually change in the, in the real design. So I think that's what the models are really good at. In a, make your really understanding the different, the different role of different parameters in, um, in your problem. Thank you very much. So uh, Dr. Elmo, uh, yeah. I think like related to that point, uh, uh, I think I was like reading a paper recently uh, and it was uh, uh, they were using machine learning to uh, sort of like evaluate uh, other parameters that may affect uh, pillar strength equations and, and they one of their conclusions was that for instance GSI should be a, an additional parameter included in these pillar strength equation formulas and they basically run a bunch of models and they vary GSI from 0 to 100 and in uh, they didn't mention ever like they, they what you're mentioning about the importance of geology on considering this you know so so what's your your opinion on, on uh, just wanting to implement like all these great machine learning technologies that, that we have, uh, implement that in, into like rock mechanics without uh, considering that that point or what do you think should be like, maybe like a recommendation on on like researchers that are, that are uh, planning to, to implement these technologies with the limited data we have, as, as you say? I mean, that's it. Pillar is actually a very good example. My PhD was about pillars. And uh, what is interesting about pillars that if you look at the literature, you have so many basically pillar formula and pillar formula site specific. You can really, very difficult to take a formula and apply to a different case, unless it's the same geology. You have a pillar formula developed in limestone mines, in granite, in metal sediments. And this idea of basically use them independently of the condition for which they were designed is potentially very dangerous. You have a parameter, basically a coefficient in, in every formula that looks at the, at the strength of the unit cube, rock mass, which is size specific. And machine learning algorithms are size specifics because you have a, a data set that used to train and validate your model. But the data set is from a particular mine. How do you apply that to a different mine? And GSI itself, I've seen machine learning where people was looking at image recognition to look at GSI, but is a very subjective parameter GSI. So, and also like, Really, what is the difference between a GSI of 60 and 62 or 65? Is exactly the same rock mass quality. So again, this is this kind of level of precision that we don't really need that in rock engineering. We are not shouldn't chase this kind of precision between a 65 or a GSI of 66 or 67. We know there's a variability. And when it comes to pillars, to me, again, you can't really come up with an equation that really follows 
com completely basically describe the behavior because those equations are empirical. And the way they were designed simply based on visual observation. You have an estimate of pillar stress, at most an estimate, difficult that you may actually get a real three-dimensional stress analysis and model being done. And people were simply walking the mine and say, this pillar looks stable, this pillar looks unstable. Visual observation, draw a line on a chart, that's your equation. Mm -hmm. So other than that you tell an algorithm that this equation is analytical. So the algorithm simply says, this is the equation, I believe the equation. But those equations are really basically potentially very subjective. So what the issue for me with those machine learning is that we take systems which are very empirical, very subjective, we use them as an input in machine learning, and we pretend that you can remove, kind of scrape the layers of subjectivity away. In reality, you're just per basically perpetuating the subjectivity, actually make it worse because the algorithm runs very fast. You actually have faster subjectivity thrown at you, dressed up as kind of a, basically uh, in a mathematical way and people believe it. And that's the problem. To me, I, I have several students doing machine learning basically uh, research, but from a point of view really of how do you get the data and what kind of data do you need? And what happens when you use different algorithms? Because they are very different on their own. So, and actually machine learning is not really new as a science. It makes it looks, we made it look like, uh, new and see, we call it machine learning. Machine learning is very appealing. Machine and learning sounds very kind of positive. Try to look at the algorithms, the actual names of the algorithms, and those are enough to scare people away because neural networks, random forest, and other type of basically systems that people say, try to imagine, explain that to a client, that your analysis is based on those basically um, systems. But if you tell them it's based on machine learning, it sounds very positive, it's definitely acceptable. So I'm pragmatic, I'm not skeptical, I, I use them. I'm, I call myself pragmatic when it comes to those systems. I'm kind of worried that we try to build machine learning on empirical systems. That doesn't solve the problem. As I said, you need a very quantitative system and then you take machine learning applied to that. Thank you very much. So is there uh, any other questions from, from the public? I think uh, Fawad, he says that we can never have a theory of everything when it comes to rock mechanical problems. That's a very good comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually true. Like it's, I mean, we are not dealing with physics. I mean, imagine people battling in physics when it comes to different uh, theory about the origin of the universe. So rock mechanics is not different. This idea of a universal kind of equation that solves our problems is it becomes an holy grail of, uh, of our research, basically. So uh, does anybody else have a, a question for uh, Dr. Elmo? So Fawad says again, if it comes to subjectivity of empirical systems, machine learning become irrelevant. Hmm. I mean, machine learning is very good to, to teach uh, an old track, basically to uh, automated basic old tracks. That's what's really useful to automate systems in the mines, in a, maybe in the processing side, in the, sometimes looking at basically sorting. That's really where it's really useful. Like it's a, more difficult to apply to a, a very kind of subjective type of discipline. Okay, so does anybody else from the public would like to maybe ask a question or, or say something to Dr. Elmo? Um, David Renani here. I was yeah. very pleased to see that your paper was published in Rock Mechanics and Rock Engineering on this subject. And I spent a lot of years um, in the uh, universities doing PhDs and postdocs and gaining um, the basic knowledge of rock mechanics and numerical modeling. And then I moved to the industry and do consulting for some uh, major civil and mining projects. And we always see in the industry this uh, competition between knowledge and experience because the hierarchy in consulting firms, for example, is that more uh, experience or um, years of service you have with a company or within the structure, uh, the higher up you will be in the hierarchy of decision making. And I was wondering, uh, with your experience in the projects that you have had, how have you been able to um, make the balance? 
knowledge and experience and how were you able to convince a group of decision makers on which one to weigh uh, higher on the list? Mm, that's uh, another very good question. It's like, I, I done work in a consulting company. I still do some work now, even if I'm at UBC. Then uh, it's mostly review work. And uh, yeah, there's the issue, this kind of believing that uh, if you have like 20 years of experience and automatically you are, a, you know, uh, how to solve the problem. And whatever basically solution you propose is going to be a right solution. The issue here to me is that how much that experience kind of a kind of variable experience did you try basically different systems and is actually your experience up to date basically with the with basically stuff that's been done in um, in rock engineering because look at basically what happened in the last 20 years with the uh behavior of brittle rock basically the s shape filler criterion and the limitation who can brown and more coulomb so how many people actually maybe are aware of that so how many people are aware of this limitation with classification systems and this kind of obsession we use in those correlations? So usually, yes, if you have more experience, you should be more knowledge. It should be, you should trust those basically that experience. But if your experience is like doing the same things over and over and over for 20 years, well, that experience does translate in a, in a large uh, knowledge. But being basically a system where experience is valued more than knowledge or more than maybe like, a, well, actually with both, actually knowledge is difficult to quantify. Experience is simply based, I've been in an industry for 20 years. So it kind of becomes a quantity, although it's kind of a quantification or kind of collective assessment, then people believe in that. And that's the way you basically get basically um, uh, judged. And uh, I've been in the same situation where maybe my idea were not basically seen as basically as relevant just because maybe I just started with a company. So in a big meeting, your voice is not really kind of a, um, basically heard because someone else who has maybe twice my your experience or 10 years of experience is basically actually basically um, uh, listened to rather than me. So you have the issue to be honest, like you should be a little bit more open to really listen to all opinions. And experience is important, but in, in a context of a, something that is so basically subjective and qualitative, well, you may get someone that's very limited experience, but is a very knowledgeable about, for example, numerical models. So they will know more than people that never run or run simple models for 20 years. But this is a, it's a different problem actually to fix. I think it, again, it really goes back really to even more to psychology and uh, the way we human interactions. So it's not just limited to rock engineering, probably in every discipline you have this problem. So, and uh, yes, I mean, to new basically, um, to people just starting the career, I would simply, my recommendation would be keep an open mind, be critical, and don't be scared to answer, to, uh, to have questions. People don't like questions sometimes in a consulting company. And uh, and if they tell you your, your question is too academic, it means that you really ask, you ask the right question and they don't know how to answer it. Yeah, I think it really comes back to that graph that you showed earlier, which had some nodes representing knowledge and experience because um, you can have um, an average level of knowledge and be exposed to many different projects, but you, the lessons that you learn from those experiences can't really make the link to infer knowledge and apply it to a new situation. Whereas if you have that fundamental deep knowledge, uh, but you have been exposed to half those cases, you can extract more knowledge from those and be able to apply those to new cases in a more a logical way. Yeah. And, and from the point of view also, kind of maybe university also guilty as well, because how much experience we give to the students in terms of field experience now. So we're not doing maybe a very good job. When I, I was lucky when I did my university in Portsmouth, we had so much field experience, like we've done three major field trips, like one field trip, just three weeks worth of geological mapping. I mean, that's really very important, basically the kind of background to students. And uh, and even later in a career, like doing some um, uh, visits to mine, not just doing co-logging over and over and over, but being exposed to different projects, different basically challenging projects. So 
I've been lucky that I had that kind of exposure, but uh, it would be good that every company realize that that's the way you basically, you make sure that your junior engineers be, becomes more knowledgeable, give them the experience and not just the same experience over and over. Just don't use them only for code logging or only for one specific task, but make sure they can be exposed to different tasks. Well, Dr. Elmo, I, I was uh, just like for, uh, I think we, we, it is already like 3.22 and I wanted yeah. to ask you like for some uh, words of uh, wisdom or words of rec re recommendations for all the students that are here, but I think you have already given uh, pretty good recommendations here. Uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, We will be posting, if you agree, this uh, recording in our uh, Arma Student Chapter uh, YouTube channel and also in our webpage, if you agree with that. Yeah, no problem, like happy. Okay. I mean, it's, it's all published material. Actually, I use this in my lectures at UBC, so there's nothing really that cannot be seen, so. Okay, so no, we're really happy uh, having you here. I, I think we all have learned a lot today and uh, this presentation has really made us, things, uh, made, made, us, made us think things that we were not thinking about before. So uh, I'm really happy with this and, and thank you very much. That, that's all I can say. Yeah, and uh, sorry again for the quick, basically the problem at the beginning, like with the switch with the time. I think it was my my fault. <laughs> no, no, it's, I think it's, I blame myself too. I should have checked. But, yeah. but uh, thank you very much. And you are always welcome here at Virginia Tech. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was great to meet you. Thanks. And eventually, maybe when we can travel again. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. In person, yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you for your time, Dr. Elmo.